Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we continue our series on the crisis in housing across the UK. Today, we take a look at yet another organisation delivering practical help to rough sleepers on the streets of London, and also feature the university, which has adopted housing as more than a subject for academic study, but as a clarion call for effective action. But first to your tweets, messages and emails in response to our series on Finland. Joe says, fake news, how can they be happy without England holding the purse strings? Tam says, in Sweden, there's a private initiative that has functions like a food bank, but not the status as national food bank. Finland doesn't have any food banks, but has a well-developed direct and decentralised food redistribution system. Mohab, who messages from Egypt, says, Thank you, Alex Salmon, for the programme today. Looking forward to watching the show next week with a vital issue in our contemporary life. Well, thank you. Granta says, Great choice of subject. We can definitely learn from all our northern cousins. Maxine says, I've been to Finland and North Karelia to learn how they do things differently. For a start, there's no litter because they have a local taxation system so people know if they drop litter, their principality has to pay for it to be uplifted. People need to be accountable and here they are not. Tarja says, going through Finnish education myself and my goddaughter started this at seven in Finland. My son in Scotland started school at five. I compared the schoolwork and noticed that in her first year she had caught up and actually overtook my son's education. My opinion is a seven-year-old can intake loads more instructions and information and the school system is more efficient in Finland. Thomas says, I've lived in Finland for the last 20 years. For me, it is a model for the potential of a small independent northern nation of 5 million people, making its own choices and priorities. And finally, Thomas says, development of the individual seems to be central, whereas in many other countries, the emphasis seems to be more for the benefit of the state. Well, thank you for all your messages, and I'm sorry if I was unable to read it out. We had a great response, and in fact, the Facebook views for one of our shows was over 326,000 people, so keep watching. Now, an estimated total of 8.4 million people in England are living in an unaffordable, insecure or unsuitable home, according to research commissioned by the National Housing Federation. The research estimated 3.6 million are living in an overcrowded home, 2.5 million are in hidden households they cannot afford to move out of, including house shares, adults living with their parents. 1.7 million are in unsuitable housing, such as older people stuck in homes they cannot get around in. 1.5 million are in poor quality homes. And 400,000 are homeless or at risk of homelessness, including people sleeping rough or living in homeless shelters. These dramatic figures illustrate that there is much more to the housing crisis than rough sleeping. However, and quite disgracefully, as a general housing crisis escalates, so rough sleeping on the streets of one of the UK's major cities rises with it. But there are plenty of people not prepared to walk by on the other side. A SWAT team conjure up images of Hollywood action movies, but there is a SWAT team operating in London, in the heart of the great city, and their intentions are much more peaceful. This is Alex's report. Now, Randy, here we are, just off the Strand, in one of the richest cities in the world. So tell us what's going on here. I mean, people have been queuing up for the last hour. I've watched them. They have. So we're here. We're serving the less fortunate in central London with food, clothing. We have medical provisions. And we signpost as much as we can. And this cam SWAT, I mean, the SWAT's good, isn't it? What does yeah. the SWAT stand for? Seek Welfare and awareness team and the so NISH... So Seek Welfare and Awareness Team? Yes. <laughs> the, the NISH CAM side of things, that means selfless. Yes. And I, I'm interested, I mean, obviously what you're doing is practical action to, to help those who yeah. are falling on hard times or are unfortunate, but how much is your religion, uh, Randy, a, a driving force in this? So, do you know, if I can just clarify something, I don't like to use the word religion. I have a responsibility to humanity to protect and to serve. So this is my driving force to why we should be doing what we're doing. Religion doesn't necessarily make you a good person. No. But then, of course, Sikhism, like Presbyterianism, uh, has a certain justification by good works, does it not? It does, absolutely. So, you know, it's a driving factor. It does drive us to do what we do. Value, values, 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 compassion, truth, forgiveness. 
So tell me about your team. I mean, you've got people serving meals, you've got the, the dentist and the, the dentist chair there, no takers as yet, but the dentist is interesting. Nobody actually volunteers to go to the dentist unless it's absolutely necessary. So tell us a bit about your team. Who, who's helping out here tonight? So we've got, so we're here four times a week just on this spot. We're out 27 times a week in 19 locations in the UK. We're serving about 4,000 meals. So this is just one of the spots we're in in central London. We've probably got about 15, about 20, 25 volunteers. We've got the food going on. We've got a little bit of clothing going on. We've got the medical team here. The medical team, today we have a dentist with us and we have a pharmacist with us and we have some hygiene packs and we've got some students with us as well. And the whole point of this is, so when we first came out here, that we were serving food. So we were kind of like, right, okay, we're, we're filling the stomachs of hungry people. They were asking us, have you got any clothes? So we added the clothing side. Then they were saying, I need a CV or I want, I want help for work. So we started to signpost. The most recent thing that I noticed or we noticed was people were in pain but they were suffering in silence so when the question was asked why do you not go to a doctor why do you not go to the hospital a and e mental health issues or they've lost faith or they've just given up they've just given up so we thought you know what we're going to do like we've brought the concept of the food from the Sikh temple the lingo to the streets we thought we are going to take the medical provisions. Because food is very much part of, of, of the Sikh faith. I mean, the communal eating is integrated, more pro perhaps than any other faith group, yeah. it's integrated into the articles of faith, is it not? It plays an absolute vital role to bring people together. You know, you can break down so many barriers with food. You sit together, you sit on the same level. You know, whether regardless of your faith, what you look like, what you eat, whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't make no difference. Social status, Come in, you're welcome. Let's sit, let's eat together. Mental health is a major, major issue here. If we can tackle mental health, we can make some gateway forward to, to looking at why people are actually ending up on the streets in the first place. So, you know, there's so many different scenarios. Being abused when you were young. Loneliness drives you to depression, drives you to gambling, drives you to whatever else it could do. So, you know, it's a can of worms. You're opening up a can of worms by saying, how come there's so much homelessness? You know, it's better to, to give than to receive. So what benefit do the people, your volunteers, get out of this experience? We need to kind of reflect at ourselves. We need to look at our volunteers. Why are our volunteers here? A lot of our volunteers are getting through some bad issues within their own personal lives, which they feel they need to give back. Then they receive that feel-good factor, as I've done something good in society, and now it's going to benefit me to kind of self-heal myself. So there is that element. And you know, let's not, let's, let's be real about this. You know, we are here, we are serving, we are trying to do a good deed. But in return, there is something that we are getting back. And it more power to your elbow, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Dal Tarden, pharmacist, dentist. How did you get roped into this project, Dal? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I was a volunteer. Uh, the first time I helped was actually on the food side. Uh, and then Randy passed me, he goes, actually, you're a qualified pharmacist. Uh, you've got a background in uh, doing charity work and things like that. So how about you heading up uh, our healthcare service for the project, uh, for Mishkarm Swap? Uh, it's a challenge to begin with. Um, we didn't know to what level of care we could go out and, and, and deliver to the homeless, uh, but we've, we've actually uh, managed to strike a really good balance. Um, where we're providing healthcare services to the homeless now on, on a weekly basis in multiple locations. So uh, it's going really well. So we, with your professional background, this is a very practical, interventionist, Absolutely. primary healthcare service. Absolutely. So uh, we, we focus on um, disease treatment as well as prevention. So in terms of prevention uh, interventions, we actually provide hygiene products. So we provide toothbrushes, toothpaste, tissues so they can clean themselves. And uh, in terms of treatment, we actually provide medicines. We, uh, we actually um, and can provide some basic level of treatment as well. Uh, Tarden, uh, you're in a, a profession where you, you don't necessarily get a queue of people <laughs> unless they're really hurting. Exactly. So tell me about the practical dentistry that you're applying on the streets. So obviously we're, we're limited to the extent of what we can do, but our primary aim here is to make sure people who usually don't have as easy access to healthcare can get some access and some information. So of course, like Dale said, prevention is key, but also when these people have the issues that they do have, we all know toothache can be quite agonising. We make sure Devil we direct all them. pains, I think Robert Burns, exactly. Scotland's national poet, called it. 
So we try to direct them to the appropriate place. And whilst we can, we try to give them whatever pain relief we can and best advice. Very rarely, there are quite a few people who have quite an acute problem. So we try to do the best we can for them here and direct them to the nearest sort of emergency service that's available. What's your best experience that you've had when you've, with your direct intervention? I mean, have you managed to get there in time to, well, to save a sure. life? Sure. I mean, uh, a, a really good example is uh, we had um, a guy who was sleeping rough on the subway um, and uh, he came to us with a bite, what he thought was a rat that had bitten him on his hand. Um, and when we uh, looked at his hand, it was actually, you know, there was a, a rash going up his arm, there was yellow pus coming out, it was awful. Um, and it had been like that for days. And for him, he didn't have access to a GP, he didn't have access to medicines from a pharmacy. Um, and the only place he could go, which he knew there was long waiting queues, was a &E. So he actually came to us as a first point of call, where we actually dressed him up, we had a nurse with us, we cleaned his wound, we dressed him up, and then we felt he needed some antibiotics, so we actually walked him over to A&E at UCLH and, and got him the care he needed. And Tan, what's the worst experience you've had? Has anybody walked to your dental chair? Hello, so within here, it's, there have been some things which are quite troubling, because obviously getting a dental infection can get quite large. One of the key problems from it is you can start to actually occlude your airway, which is quite a severe thing to happen. So there was one person where we actually had to call the emergency services to pick him up from here. Fortunately, I've got a bit of a hospital dentistry and surgery in my background, so I knew exactly what to do to stabilise them in the meantime. We got them seen straight away by the local MaxFax unit. And the patient was very grateful. They came back a few weeks later saying, thank you very much, guys. They kept me in for a few days for IV antibiotics. I really looked after them and prevented them getting something which could have become dramatically worse. And the reason why they came to us is because of the sort of distrust that they had for going to hospitals. Because Can I ask you is. about the ethos behind the, the SWAT team? Let's call you that. The, I mean, here we are, we're just off the Strand in the, one of the richest cities in the world. Uh, and yet we've got you know, people without access to primary health care, homeless in many cases, people without uh, access to, to food and the, the basics of life. I mean, how does, what motivates you to use your professional expertise to take practical action? I mean, for me as a practicing Sikh, uh, my faith has a huge uh, bearing on that. It, it, it motivates me to come out here with, with the community and actually serve the community and live a life of service. And for me, that, that's what I try and do, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's here in my spare time, um, giving. I have a, there is a real sense of joy in giving. And I think that's why I come out here every week. Exactly. It's the exact same principle as what Dallas described. It's that principle of looking after your fellow people, treating everyone as one, regardless of their faith or their background, to indiscriminately look after everyone and do as much as you can. I'm fortunately blessed that I've managed to go into the profession I am, so if I can sacrifice my time to help others, I'm more than willing to do that on a regular basis. How is it in terms of public policy? We can't get to a situation where everybody has a, a home to go to in a, what is, by any standards, a, a rich, powerful country. From what we can see, we can see we see people coming from all sorts of backgrounds in terms of getting, ending up into a situation. The thing is, no one has ever got into it intentionally. It's all through misfortune, certain personal tragedies. And what we find it's not is, a life choice. It's not a life choice, exactly. But what we find is, there's at times, there's, there's big blockades. So, for example, in healthcare, there was a big push from the Brownswell charity to make sure that people are aware you don't need to have a fixed abode to be able to register with a GP. And it's awareness more than anything. Uh, it's lack of awareness from sort of the members of the homeless community about that they, they do have a right to access to care and that they need to push for that right a little bit more in certain places. Guys, thanks for what you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, Thank pleasure. you. Now, Katpa, what, what's your role in this project? Um, it's a blessed role and I'm, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to manage the warehouse. So um, every weekend we have Duke of Edinburgh volunteers that come and help us and we tidy up and arrange all the donations that come in. What's that quantity of, of materials that's going through your warehouse? Um, OK, it's quite a lot. Um, it's thousands of cups, um, food containers, spoons, and then we arrange the boxes by van, where we have three vans that go from the warehouse, as well as the healthcare section, um, organising non-perishable foods as well, and also fruit and sugar. So it's quite a logistical operation, yeah. in other words. You said you were blessed to be working on this project. What do you mean by that? I don't think... It's, it's an opportunity that is once in a lifetime and it's such a blessing and like I gain so much from it. Um, I don't think people realise it but it's not actually me helping, it's me gaining something from it. So yeah, I feel really blessed to be a part of, I suppose, making a difference to humanity. That's a great message. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Join us after the break where we'll move from street action to academic study. However, this is a university course with a difference. Join us then. Welcome back to the Alex Salmon Show and our continuing series on the housing crisis. 
Many universities study housing, but the Chichester University Housing Project is a very special course. Alex finds out why. Let's look at the, how the issue of homelessness has been tackled outside the capital city of London. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Becky Edwards, a senior lecturer in social work and social care at the University of Chichester. David Daly, someone who was homeless and now is uh, studying for a Master of Arts in Creative Writing. And Lucy Davis, someone who was first homeless at the age of 16 and now studying for a Bachelor of Arts. So th this sounds absolutely splendid, Becky. So you, you thought as a, a university, one of the country's smallest universities, Indeed. that this is a, an area you should be taking a direct interest in. This is an issue which uh, something academia could do something about. Yeah, we're a very small university and we are very keen that the University of Chichester is much more involved with the local community anyway. And at the same time, as we were trying to think of what we could do, ways that we could make that happen, we were approached by the local homeless charity or a local charity for people affected by homelessness called Stone Pillow, who asked a, uh, for ideas about how we could work together collaboratively and that is where the project was born, I guess. Uh, David, uh, you're someone, you spent what, a quarter of a century in teaching. That's right. And then fell on hard times. Yes. Now you find yourself back in academia doing yes. a, a Master of Arts in Creative Writing. Yeah. So tell us a bit about you know, how you became homeless yourself. I became homeless in about 2014 when various personal circumstances just led to a downfall. and. Uh, somebody said earlier on about how things can, you can lose things very quickly, so I did. I ended up losing everything, so I became. I, I had problems with addiction and I had problems with homelessness. But I, because I'd had a, quite a long career, I did try. I, there was something in me says you can't be doing this for the rest of your life, but it's quite difficult. You can get into hell quite easily. Getting out is quite something else. So in, in that, you know, twenty four, you were a PC physical team. education teacher mm -hmm. in, uh, in London, but but your home base was Liverpool. Yeah. In that time, you know, your secure job, you. Uh, well-respected job, and did you ever think that you know things might disintegrate as they did? That's a really good question because nobody ever imagines it will happen to them, and nobody nobody ever understands how quickly it can happen as well. It's not it's not a long it, it can be a long process, but sometimes it can take place in less than a year. All you need is a tragic event in the family, followed by another tragic event. All of a sudden, everything everything I had, speaking just for myself, just fell apart. I fell apart. It was a kind of, kind of disintegration in the end. And then, then I did lose everything. So you hit rock bottom. Yep. And, and then what happened there? And then I, I moved down here to be, because to, I had some friends down here, and then I got involved with, I did some voluntary work to try and get myself back on my feet. I wasn't sure if I ever wanted to go back and be a school teacher ever again. And then I got involved with Stone Pillow. They, they came out, they stepped out and helped me. You know, gave Stone me Pillow's a, a charity yeah, working with the, 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 support homeless. the homeless. Many, many great authors have always said that, you know, that's the, the personal experience that gave them the greatest work. Does, does the, the, the fact that your life has had highs and lows, does that yeah, yeah, yeah. assist in how you, you, you transmit that to the page? The creative writing thing, it's always been an interest of mine. I've always been a reader and that kind of thing. And yes, I know, you know, hard times and George Orwell and Dickens and this kind of thing. Not that I'm aspiring to be like them. But over the course of the year, I was just got absorbed back into education after being in it for a quarter of a century, like you said. But education in a different format, Sec you know, university education. It's not the same as a secondary school as a sixth form. So while I had some core skills, I had some transferable skills as well. So once I got into working with Becky, working with the, with the, with the cohort, I was, just, I was back where I, I belonged, back in education. It's where, I, it's where I've missed. Lucy Davis, you were 16 years old when you, you spent your first night uh, as a rough sleeper. That's right, tell, yes. Tell us a bit about, go back to that night and what you felt. A sense of everything that I knew coming crashing around me, a sense of sheer panic, um, complete disorientation, complete unknown. Like all my anchor point, points, that's something we learnt about in the access course, were suddenly just completely torn away. Um, so, sense of hopelessness, feeling lost, betrayed, and completely uncertain as to what's going to happen to me now. So, Lucy, what, what happened to you then? I sofa surfed 
around various sort of friends that I knew from college. Like sofa stuff, I mean, like, go, go from oh, place to place. Staying or... from place to place on floors of wherever people would have me. And then I ended up living in a van on the side of the A27 by Lansing College. Um, and then from there, kind of built my life back up until up until about sort of three, four years ago when I found myself homeless again. And now what's happened? Well, my most recent stint with Stone Pillow was last year. I worked very hard in the equestrian industry, burnt the candles at both ends. Then I had some difficulties with family um, and some mental health problems as well, which caused me to lose absolutely everything that I'd worked hard to achieve um, at being 30 now. Um, so, as I said, I found myself going through Stone Pillow for the, for the third time. Um, accessing their services, uh, the work they do is brilliant in helping us and people like me to rebuild their lives. And now you've arrived at a position you're, you're doing a, a Bachelor of Arts. Uh, I mean, yes. would you ever, as a, a 16 year old sleeping rough, think to yourself, well, in a few years time I'll be embarking on a university course? No, I never would have ever dreamt that I would find myself getting to the opportunity to study fine art at Chichester University. The very idea of studying was a sort of fleeting romantic idea that I'd have every now and then, but not coming from a traditional academic background, I never would have dreamt in a million years that I would. And so suddenly as well, out of nowhere, poof, and I'm, yeah, I'm doing it. Becky, tell me about the University of Chichester and, and, and how it sees its role. I mean, many people think of universities as ivory towers, yeah. you know, big ivory towers in the case of Oxbridge, yeah. small yeah. ivory towers in the case of Chichester. But how do you see your role as a university in, in assisting people out of a nadir, a, a bottom yeah. in their lives to, to something quite different? Is this a, an active thing that you're saying, right, this is our purpose, Absol or one of our purposes? Absolutely. To, so to us, that concept of the ivory tower is something we want to break down. The thing that struck me, so the first time I met um, the guys, uh, the, the guys who became members of our, of our bridging module, our access course, it was on a resilience course that my boss and I were running and um, Stone Pillow had asked us to run it so we didn't know what to expect, we just knew that we had some people coming out of addiction and homelessness who were going to be in a room and we were going to deliver a training and um, as I listened to the insightful things, and I know that sounds patronising, but I, I can't think of another way of saying it. As I listened to what they were saying, I could, I just, I said to my boss afterwards, all of these guys could be studying with us. You see, most of your fellow students will be, what, 10 years younger than you or so. Do you ever feel like occasionally giving them a shake and saying, look, for goodness sake, stick in. <laughs> this yeah. is really important for your future. Everyone is an individual and we all grow as individuals very differently and everyone kind of has to learn their life lessons in their own way. And the wonderful thing about the fine art uh, course I'm doing is it's actually a very broad mix of age. Um, the eldest, she's actually 70 and incredibly youthful. So we don't, I haven't really found myself with a load of teenagers. You're we're all, <laughs> we're all a wonderful mix, really. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Now, guys, if you were Prime Minister for the day, well, let's say we got Boris Johnson decided to go away for, the, for an away day uh, and put you in charge of, uh, of matters for, uh, for a day. What would you be saying, David? What would be your action on this issue of homelessness? What I'd really like to do is stand up in front of the House of Commons and say, do you know what's going on down at Chichester University? Do you know what's happening down there? Look at what's going on. Look at how people's lives are being saved. Look at how education is transforming. Look how homelessness is being addressed down there with little funds, just people who are motivated, people who want to make a difference, and people who want to see people progress and succeed. And that is what I'd like to say to the Commons. And Lucy, you're Prime Minister. I've appointed you Prime Minister for the day. What are you going to do? What I would say is that I would like to elect Becky as Prime Minister. <laughs> and my reason for that choice is because we need more people like Becky on this planet, in power, whichever way you want to put it, because if it was not for her sheer determination 
and complete belief and enthusiasm in all of us on the Access course. I don't believe any of us really would have gone for it or stuck with it. Becky, you have been appointed oh, Prime Minister, not, not just by myself, but by Lucy. So what are you going to do with it? So the first thing I would do is fill Parliament with people who actually care, as opposed to people who are there for themselves and with their own agenda. And the second thing I would do is say, put some funding into projects like this one so we can give people coming out of homelessness hope that their lives can take a different direction and my dream would be that all universities offer something like this and it's not true Lucy you'd have done it without me <laughs> <laughs> but guys I can't make you Prime Minister for the day but what I can do is present you with the Alex Simon Quay now this is Scottish it's Gaelic actually the Quay means a loving cup mm -hmm. and what you do is you put uh, well traditionally whiskey but soft drink will do just as well uh, but it has to be Scottish, nothing mm -hmm. else works. You put it in the quake and you pass it round all your classmates and, and celebrate the success of the University of Chichester's Homelessness Project. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank you very much. A new decade, a new government, but an old crisis. The statistics from England and Wales point to a crisis which is getting worse, not better. Every shift in social security, every delay in planning, every change in household formation has ensured that millions stay in poor or unsuitable accommodation. Even in Scotland, where policy changes have seen a sharp reduction in homelessness over the last 10 years, the statistics have now started to turn in the wrong direction. And the rapidly rising build of a new generation of council housing has not been enough to fully replace the collapse in private building since the financial crisis of a decade ago. And as the housing market tightens across England due to shortage of supply, then thousands more fall off the cliff to homelessness. In this series, we featured those taking practical action to combat homelessness. Every success you have had in restoring a homeless person to society should be a cause for celebration. From the streets of London to the University Halls of Chichester, people are doing their best and often their best has very good outcomes. However, you cannot solve a housing crisis without building houses. And the hard fact is that construction is still far below the levels before the financial crash. In the recent election, little or nothing from the featured debates focused on housing. We will have to hope that this does not mean that little or nothing follows in terms of public action. But for now, for me, Alex and all of the team, it's goodbye and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>